there's a lot of opportunity within pain and suffering if you're willing to not just like ruminate on the pain and suffering if you're willing to say like okay let's look at this why is this so painful and then to like be able to lift yourself out of it gives you reassert your resilience and also gives you the confidence the next time Hello, and thank you for joining me here on Hope to Recharge podcast, the podcast that's designed to break the stigma around mental health and to create some hope and inspiration and give some practical tips to those that are struggling with mental health, whether it's from personal stories to break the stigma or some advice from professionals in the mental health community. Whether you are struggling with mental health on your own or you know a loved one that is struggling, we are here to support you and to create a community so you you know you are not alone. The road to recovery can be difficult and challenging. At Hope to Recharge, we believe that in mental health, together is always better. I'm your host, Matana. Thank you for joining me here today. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Are you looking for online therapy? Are you stuck at home like everyone else? High stress, high anxiety, worried about the future, trying to navigate everything, have a lot of worries, had a lot of emotional roller coaster rides up and down, just like me. BetterHelp.com is one phone call away, one Zoom call away, one text away. It's an online platform for therapy. It's so perfect for now, for coronavirus, for what people are going through now. We can reach out and get the perfect therapist that meets our needs. Don't wait. Check them out. See if you can find somebody. Don't struggle. They're so affordable. They are so affordable. You're sitting at home. Every therapist is working online now. Reach out and get help you need. If you are struggling, don't struggle in silence. I am so grateful that they are giving us 10% off the first month so you can get affordable access to therapy. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge, start your wellness, get help, get support you need. Hello, and thank you for joining me here today. Can you hear how excited I am? Can everybody (laughs) feel the vibration in my body? I am jumping out of my skin because I am so excited to be here with Jen Gotch. She's been on my list before I even dreamt of a podcast. And then when I started thinking about my podcast, she right away went on my list, people to interview. And then I found out that she has a podcast and I'm like, oh my God, every time I listen to the podcast, I wasn't breathing. I was literally not breathing. And then Jen says that she might stop her podcast. And I'm like, no, please don't stop your podcast. And then I didn't say who Jen is. Jen Jen is the founder of Banjo. She's also the chief creative officer of Banjo, which is a lifestyle company that's so cool and and a multi-million dollar lifestyle company that's all about sharing love, excitement, happiness, together is better kinds of quotes. I wear a lot of their t-shirts. I have their mugs. I have their pens. My little daughter has her sparkly pens and she calls them my pens. Besides that, she just came out with a book, which I fell in love with, which is The Upside of Being Down. Wow. 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 So as you can see, she's super creative. Since she's a little girl, Jen has been super creative. Her mind just, I feel like her mind sits in art and creativity and just so much color. I'm actually wearing her t-shirt now. And on the t-shirt, it says, last night I had a dream and you were in it. And you know why I wanted to tell Jen before I say hello, Jen. Okay. Yeah, I'm so- <laughs> okay. As a little girl, as a little before my, my mental illness journey came to me, as a little girl, I always had dreams. And you know, I'm Orthodox Jew and they always used to call me the Joseph, the dreamer, because my dreams always came true. And people used to say to me, if you dream something negative, don't tell me. But if you're dreaming that I'm having a baby or I'm getting married or I won the lottery, tell me right away. <laughs> and I would became that person of the dream. And when I, when my whole journey with depression and anxiety started 10 years ago, I needed to disconnect from my dreams. I felt like it was so much. And I'm like, stop, stop, stop. And I went to a healer and I said, disconnect me. And I didn't even know that there's such a thing, but I was so sensitive at the time. The vibrations were so high. And some people are listening and probably don't understand 
understand what I'm talking about, but Jen is nodding. <laughs> so I, so my vibrations were so high. I couldn't be more in tune because I was picking up on everything and every little thing I was picking up was bringing me down and I needed to focus on my well-being and my health. So I love this shirt because I really dream all the time about what's going on in my life. My subconscious picks up. And when I got better, I was able to dream again. And I, oh. and recently I started dreaming again, not as intense, but it's really part of who I am. So I feel like this shirt really represents me. And it's a, it's a bandeau shirt. <laughs> and I love, I love it. it. I think I came up with that phrase actually. So, well, you're very creative. So <laughs> everything is sometimes by Jen. Jen is okay. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thank you for joining me here, Jen. It's of such course. a privilege. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you. I hope you're excited at, at least half as much as I am. <laughs> so I want to just give you a little bit of a background on who I am, because I don't think you know who I am. So I grew up in Israel. I came to the States. Where I married my husband when I was 26. I moved to the States. I left my whole family in Israel. Um, I grew up extremely orthodox, ultra orthodox. And when you write in your book about your grandparents, like I felt a little bit like, okay, she, she's going to get me a little bit. I left my whole family and we're, I'm one of six. We're super close. We're like the super tight. We don't separate even though we're all, we, we could be all over the world, but we're, we connect all the time. And, and me moving to America was really a big step for me to start my life. I was in a corporate world, living the life. I lived in Hong Kong for a year. I traveled to Africa, China, Thailand, everywhere, Australia, Europe. I was like making a lot of money, had a company car, had like 30 or 40 people working under me. And this was when I was like less than 26. Right. I was living the wow. life. And I'm like, why the hell would I want to get married and give all this up, right? Not me. <laughs> My sisters were having babies and in the corporate world, we're very high achievers in our family. And I said, I can't do both. I just can't. I knew that I yeah. cannot do both. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm really going to yeah, die. So same. God sent me a husband from America that had to take me away from my job that I would yeah. not be able to leave because I was so connected to everything there. Moved to America, started my life here. So I started with really nobody. Like I just started my life, had a baby, another baby, another baby. And everything was great. I was traveling. I was a stay-at-home mom, my dream. And one day I just hit myself with a terrible terrible depression, anxiety oh. episode, lots of in and out of hospitals. And my journey to recovery is still going on. I feel like I recovered majorly, but not the, as you write in your book, it's never, it's, it's never, never ending. It's never, never truly ending. truly over. Never. Yeah. When I read your book, so this is where I'm getting to. When I read yeah. your book, I felt, first of all, I'm so happy that there's also the audio because I, I, I was closing my eyes and listening to your voice. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm having a seven hour coffee with Jen. This is, <laughs> I can feel your personality. So even though I had the hardcover, I always get the audio if it's available, especially yeah. if it's with the author, because I feel like I can get so much more out of it. And especially with dyslexia, it's just so much easier for me. I can cook with it. I have five children. I can cook with it. I, they, they can play. I travel a lot. Comes in my little buds in my ear. <laughs> And I was literally sitting there. My husband's like, what are you doing for so many hours? I said, you cannot bother me. I'm like, like <laughs> I'm on a trans here. I am <laughs> listening to this. I listened to it twice. I want to tell you one thing about what, what happened at the end. I was so sad that it ended. Aww. I was like, no, don't go. Don't go. <laughs> no, tell me more. Tell me more. And I was so happy they were saying that you might come out with a second book. But so much that I read there resonated with me. Good. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this. No. And that's why you're such a gift to the world. You share so openly what some of us are so embarrassed and shamed yeah. to share. And if yeah. we do share, we're like, do we do, do we do it right? Do we do it wrong? What's the, what, what's, what's going to be the backlash? And you're so fun. You're so colorful and you're, you're so hopeful. And one of the biggest chapters by you in the book was your chapter about hope that everything you live is hope. And this whole, podcast is on hope to recharge. And, yeah. and I said that if you can give us some of your time to, we'll touch about a, a, a few chapters of your life that touched me the most that I feel like my audience also touched them and will touch them and help them come out of that shame, fear, anxiety, and needing to change who they are to fit into the world that they feel sometimes not belonging. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's why it's important 
for whomever is comfortable talking about it to talk about it and see that not only is it safe, but you're in good company. You know, and it's a very mental health. When you have mental health issues, it can feel very solitary. But the truth of the matter is you could look around you when we used to be able to convene as groups and there would be plenty of people within arm's distance that were also struggling. So I feel like that's starting to bubble up more, but that was a huge reason for me uh, in wanting to write that specific book. And you did such a phenomenal job and everybody should have it. And I think kids should read it because you talk a lot about your childhood there. And it all starts from your childhood. And I think it all starts in everyone's childhood. You speak about your parents so highly and it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And I feel like your father was your biggest cheerleader. Yeah, he still right? is. He still yeah. is. Like yeah. he adores you to pieces. Like yeah, he really does. It's it's wild. Sometimes I'll, uh, I mean, I think I say in the book, you know, where I was like, well, what would what didn't you like about me or what was wrong? And he was like, nothing. I mean, he was being totally honest. Like it, that's obviously not the case. There, there are pros and cons to everyone, but yeah, he's just, I think just not burdened by some of the things that many of us are burdened by that keep us from being able to accept in that way. Was he always so fun and totally. up- Always. Always. Yeah. Unwavering. He, my dad is very consistent. Very consistent. And your mom, in the book, it sounds like she was more of a deeper understanding and she helped you find your voice. Absolutely. I mean, she, you know, she has faced her own struggles throughout her life. And, and just like me, and I'm sure I get this from her, has a real curiosity about personal growth and healing. And, um, you know, so she was always sort of listening to or knows into a book about any of those things. You know, we just, our personalities are quite different. So our intensity, you know, sometimes uh, <laughs> clashed, you know, it can sort of, you know, and I think I say that it's like one of my most intense relationships is my relationship with my mom because there are really high highs and low lows and it it's not the same every time and it has changed and evolved so much throughout my life that it is in stark contrast to my dad and that relationship with him, which is just very stable and consistent. But I like that I have both. You know, I feel like I'd be a total monster if I had two of my dad. Oh, really? <laughs> I would think like, I don't have to do, improve anything. I'm perfect. You know, like my mom sort of challenging me in that way, although hard as a younger person and certainly wish in some ways it could have been done differently. Nonetheless, I tend to look at the bright side of things. I feel like it was, well, it helped make me who I am. And I love both my parents very much. So they're such a beautiful combination. And it's, it's cute to see how they're happily married so many years later. And it's hard to find that nowadays. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, like any married couple, they have had their challenges and continue to have challenges. You know, I think at a certain point, you decide you're going to stay together or you're not, and you're going to, you know, exist in the way that you are. I think a huge motivation for them staying together for many years was the kids, you know, and I, I, I don't have kids, but I understand that because I wanted to stay together with my husband because of a dog. So I can't imagine what it would feel like to have children and think about that. But I feel like they, they do a good job existing as a couple, you know, and just working through it. As parents, you know, you said before that he, it, you would be a monster if you had two of your fathers, and I think that's a that's a little bit exaggerated, like exaggerated. But but in a way, I'm wondering if tough love is really necessary for every child, like to really show you who you are and and hold a mirror up to you that you can dig deep. Yeah, I uh, I don't think I, I actually don't know. I think my mom would have would have really I mean, I don't think this she's said it to me before that like probably would have leaned into more of a tough love approach. Um, But my dad was very uncomfortable with that. And so neither of them really got to parent in the way that they wanted, but they had very different parenting styles. And so to me, you know, I think it probably starts with an agreement on the parenting style. I mean, 
this was 1971. There was no awareness. There certainly wouldn't have been a discussion on parenting styles. They were like 23 and 25. And so, but, you know, certainly considering the temperament of your children and knowing that they may, you may have multiple children and they may be different seems important to me. But, you know, in the end, I think you just do your best and do what feels right. And, um, you know, my, my parents were not perfect parents. They would admit to that. I don't ever in looking back and even the hardest, like most tense times between my mom and I, I don't ever think she wasn't trying to do her best. It just wasn't landing with me. But um, I think that's why it's able, I'm able to sort of process the things that happened and move through it because they were good people trying. They were failing, but they were trying and they were succeeding and they were trying. And I think, you know, when I hear some of my friends' experiences with their parents, like, they oftentimes had at least one parent that was not doing their best, was not even doing a medium amount of, you know, anywhere close to that. So I, I feel very grateful. And I think, you know, that's one of my philosophies in life is just to try to do my best in every moment, knowing that that will not look the same every day. That's okay. Because in the end, that's really all you can do. <laughs> <laughs> and you also take experiences from others the same way. And you say they're trying the best today. It doesn't yes. mean that tomorrow their best will be like today. And yes. that's how you can forgive in a way for things that you feel like went wrong yesterday, even though today went a little bit better. Of course. And that doesn't mean it doesn't leave a mark and I don't have to continue to go to therapy and unwind from stuff. It just means that like low level or underlying anger or resentment or you, you sort of can eradicate some of that, which can really cloud your judgment when you're trying to heal. I feel like it helps me operate from a healthier place. Your mom shared something with me on Friday and she said, Jen made me understand myself better after many years. I think that is like the biggest compliment you can get from a parent, like the biggest, like to <laughs> know that as much as it was hard, especially with mental illness, we don't understand the children. I'm as a mom, I don't understand what do they want? Like, I wish I had a GPS, like a, like a <laughs> stick in my mind that says me, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. And for a mother to say that, I think that that's such a gift that you yeah. were able to give her was clarity into herself and some kind of healing in her past. Yeah, well, I've been actively trying to do that, especially over the last few years as I explored the podcast and the book which were both, you know, autobiographical. So it like really helped me learn a lot and give me clarity on her situation as well as mine that I didn't feel like she had. And when you, I'm 48. So it's like, I feel like you get to a point in your life where you realize in some situations, you may know more than your parents. Like you just, you don't grow up thinking that you, those are your experts, you know, that's who you go to for information. And I think like, I just got to a certain point where I was like, I might understand some of this more than she does. I could try to explain it to her because I have the benefit of knowing her really well. I'm glad she feels that way. You know, sometimes we hold up mirrors to each other and want to break the mirror and tell them <laughs> to get lost. <laughs> but in the end, I do think it gets through regardless of how it's met initially. Well, that's it's like, uh, I felt like, like uh, I wish, I mean, my mom listens to every episode and she's going to say something. She's like, of course, I learned from you. Yeah. And like, she's my biggest advocate. My father is very similar to your father. My father was always the clown of the universe, right. like literally the clown. When I was little, I was so shy. It was, oh, I was goodness. painfully shy. I didn't yeah. want to travel alone anywhere. Like if yeah. I went on a bus, I had to be with someone. I, I was uncomfortable in my own skin. And my father was the complete opposite. Like he walked to anywhere, anyone, dream, like excitement. Goodbye, driver. Thank you for <laughs> driving me from the the back of the bus, giving out candy. And, and I was mortified. I was mortified. I'm like, oh my God. But everybody loved him because he was sunshine. He was literally yeah. sunshine. Yeah. And my father and my mother was like the, like the stable person of the family. Like right. she, she was the one taking care of us, dinner, lunch, whatever school. And the balance, I think the balance was very important for me. I could yeah. never go and talk to my father about my feelings because he cannot handle it. Right. Cannot handle it. Right. My mother can analyze with me. She can go deep sure. into it. So seeing that with your, I, I saw so many connections, but I don't think my mother, my mom will say, um, you made me a better person. 
I don't know. Maybe I'll, she'll say you created more gray hairs for me growing up. <laughs> well, I'm sure my mom would say that as well. Too. <laughs> and I'm sure she will listen to this as well. So thank you. Yeah. She says, <laughs> she says, she says that she listens to everything you do because she, oh. she's, she really is your biggest advocate and she, and your father too. It's, it's beautiful to see. One of the things that you share about being a child was that you were a highly sensitive person. Yeah. I didn't find out about it until I interviewed somebody for the show sure. for Hope to Recharge. I didn't even know that such a thing existed. Mm -hmm. I just knew that I'm always itchy. Yeah. I can't wear stockings because I'm going to rip my skin off. And growing yeah. up ultra orthodox, you had to wear it to school. Oh, so gosh. for eight hours of the day, I was playing in my mind, how fast am I going to get it off when I get inside the house? Mm -hmm. I had to wear, like when I go out, I have to wear a wig because we cover our hair, like right. the headache, um, everything. And I didn't know about it. And it was yeah. so validating. I'm like, oh my God, this is a real thing. So wearing a mask now during this, the COVID yeah. is hell. Like, yeah. I don't like complaining about these things, but it's so hard. How did you know so young that that's what you had? No, I, did, I didn't. I I only found out about it in writing the book. When you sort of revisit your, your memories and your childhood in the context that you thought it existed, sometimes you find out that it's representative of something completely different than what you thought. And I was looking at sort of a collection of childhood experiences that I sort of had identified one way. And I thought, no, you know, I just wanted attention. Like, and I had attentive parents, so I never thought that I wasn't getting attention, but I just felt very unseen. And uh, I think that is it's a symptom of being a highly sensitive person. I think when you're struggling with mental health issues, especially at a young age, you feel misunderstood. But I literally, as I was processing these stories, went into Google and typed in, why did I feel unseen as a child? And that highly sensitive person thing came up. And I was like, oh, I always have felt that I have high sensitivity, but you know, I'm a strong person. So I was like, well, I wonder what this means. And then I took the quiz and I was like, Oh, and then I called my mom and I was like, you got to take this quiz. I think, I think we're both HSPs. So considering it's like 15 to 18% of the population, it's strange how most people hadn't heard of that. I mean, I went into Bando the next day. I was like, you're an HSP, you're an HSP. <laughs> so yeah, most of, I didn't know anything in my childhood or my twenties. Like it really was it wasn't until late 20s, early 30s that I started to get a lens on things. And even now, I mean, even this last week, I've realized several things that I'm like, oh, okay. So there's still work to be done. <laughs> I don't think we outgrow it. It no. just, we adapt to it. So for example, for me, I can't, I love people, but I get very overwhelmed by them. So I need sure. to know when to stop. I need yeah. to know when I need my quiet time to lock myself. I have five children, when to lock myself and say, it's mommy time, do not bother me because yeah. I'm going to become a monster. Yeah. So I learned that only afterwards. What do I need to take off as soon as I get home? Yeah. Put in the comfortable pants and comfortable t-shirt, no jewelry. Yeah. All like when I'm in the house, no jewelry. What to try? traveling. Only later on in life did I learn that it was a real thing. And I didn't know it. I didn't know that it had to do with uh, not being seen. It's funny that you say that. It's not funny. It's interesting. I Because my l number 100 episode, I was interviewed by somebody to just give me a different perspective of myself. Sure. What you don't know about me. The biggest thing that came out, it was not a planned episode. We just took the conversation. And the biggest thing that came out is that I didn't feel a belonging growing up. I just didn't feel yeah. a belonging. And I crave belonging. Yeah. And I felt like I was a nobody. Yeah. And now it makes sense. Like I, I was, I just wanted someone to hide me all the time don't see me because yeah. whatever you're going to see, you're not going to like yeah. compared to everything around me. So because I don't fit, so just disconnect me. Well, and that's a part, you know, the thing that I've learned is, especially over the last couple of years, is that it's, it's sort of a puzzle, you know, uh, and there's lots of pieces. It's not just 
because I have anxiety disorder or I'm a highly sensitive person or someone one time told me I was ugly and it left a mark on me or because my grandparents were in the Holocaust and, you know, epigenetics and here's that or what happened to me as a baby that I don't even know. Like it's so, I've always thought of it as very cut and dry, like for most of my life, you know, because it's like with mental illness, you get a diagnosis, you have clarity, you have symptoms, you have the potential to take medication if you like. And it's like, okay, I understand this is the cause of of that. But as it turns out, we're very complex. <laughs> and there, I mean, you, if you choose to, can spend your whole life exploring what makes you, you. I find that stuff very interesting. So the highly sensitive person piece of that was really interesting to me because it did take this set of symptoms that were. I thought just like quirks really more than anything else. Like I'm always cold or like you said, like a tag inside of a clothes is like murder for me. Um, and just was like, Oh, okay. This is like due to a physiological thing. I'm and it's just, not our, our fault. Nerve endings are deeper. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. And it's not like our that. fault. Yeah. We're not damaged not good. Not. Right. It's not good or bad anyway. So there's nothing to be at fault. It just is, you know? So, so yeah, I, I find that stuff super interesting, but I've learned to not, um, feel like, okay, I've solved it. It's this now. <laughs> it's like, okay, I have this next piece of the puzzle. And then that's how that fits in. Okay, what's next? I think it's really interesting. As someone that um, that likes um, figuring things out, I sometimes overanalyze because I want yeah. to get to the bottom of it. And sometimes it's the biggest curse. So it's yes. nice to sit and analyze with someone or like stay up till four o'clock in the morning trying to understand when this person said these three words, what did they really mean? And what yeah. happened before? And what were they looking at? And what was I saying? How was I saying? And sometimes it's a blessing and sometimes yeah. it's a real curse because yeah. we're our mind is just going over and over and over. And I yeah. think it has to do with a highly sensitive person piece because we just pick up on everything. What were they looking at? What was their facial? We can re literally set yeah. up the set again and we yeah. won't miss an ounce of what yeah. really happened. And in a way, like I feel like I was saying before, my dreams are part of the highly sensitive yeah. aspect because sure. I'm more in tune to the energies going on in the world. And sometimes it's so tiring. Yes, of course. Well, that's, I mean, that's also empathy. And so there's a whole thing about, I mean, you already said it, just how you uh, work to protect yourself once you identify that that is a thing and it's not a thing that everyone feels and it is a good thing. And at times, it can compromise you. So it is understanding. I mean, you, you articulating like, this is when I need mommy time, or I understand that if I put myself in this situation, it's going to be draining. So I'll have to plan for that. You know, that's where you have the advantage because most people are walking around just knowing that they don't feel good, but are just more comfortable not feeling good than trying to get to the bottom of why they don't feel good. And I feel like, um, you know, those of us that are curious get the benefit of alleviating some of our pain by sorting some of that stuff out and giving it clarity. Because at least for me, like once I have an answer to something, it's easier for me to eradicate something you know, a behavior or thought or feeling that I just don't need. I, I'll say it's a blessing, but I really think that my mental breakdown was a blessing to me understanding all the hardships that I went through. And I call it, I was reborn. I gave, yeah. I was reborn and I was given permission to go inside and dig all those stuff up that I was suppressing all the years, thinking I was okay. I come from the yeah. greatest family, a very popular family on both sides. So many cousins, so much excitement, so much in my and my bucket list was done, but yeah. yet I was feeling, who am I? Yeah. And I was given permission to go to, I gave myself permission when I had my mental collapse to go and see, but like, what, what am I burying here? Yeah. What's really going on? What does Matana want? What does she believe? What does she need? Right. And I never gave myself permission to do that. So when someone has a mental collapse, it's usually because we're suppressing so much that we don't understand. Sure. Oh, 100%. I mean, that's why my book opens with that really very pivotal time in my life. And that's why the book is called The Upside of Being Down, because it because I agree, you know, I feel like it was nothing but a gift. I, 
I feel like I was strangely acutely aware of that when it happened because you do immediately feel a release, you know, it's like a break in the pressure. And, you know, if you're willing to explore that, that is the opportunity within, there's a lot of opportunity within pain and suffering. If you're willing to not just like ruminate on the pain and suffering, if you're willing to say like, okay, let's look at this. Why is this so painful? And then to like be able to lift yourself out of it gives you, reassert your resilience and also gives you the confidence the next time because inevitably things will go wrong again. It's not, life doesn't just get better and then it's that way forever. Like that's just not what, what we're doing here. Uh, but at least I know for me and I I'm sure it's the same for you. You know, once you've been through some stuff, you, it's not as scary. Like it still hurts and feels compromising and challenging when it happens again. But you at least know, like, I'm most likely going to get through this and I'm going to have some gifts that I get from it and be able to take those into the next thing. You know, um, and that's why, I, I mean, that's a huge reason why I think there's a real positive to, to, suffering. I just think like that's a very controversial yes. <laughs> idea for some people. Well, I mean, right, right. some people are like, yeah, exactly. And some people right. are like, how dare you? <laughs> right, right. At what point did you decide that it, you are safe sharing your experiences and your mental health journey? You know, I think that I... I never felt unsafe. I think it really was another symptom of not feeling heard or seen like within the family, you know? Um, and again, to no fault of my parents, really, they were just, that was my constitution mixed with their lives. And I just, because I remember as soon as I could find people that would listen, that I could tell were really listening, I just wanted to pour it out, you know, like as a teenager, and then obviously going into talk therapy, it was like, here's this person not only listening, but taking notes <laughs> on what I'm saying. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> I'll, let me just give her all of it. And then I think, you know, so as it's sort of serving this um, craving that I had, that's maybe more codependency and, you know, that's maybe like seemingly negative things. It also was giving me a comfort level with sharing and a confidence about how I was feeling and that there really wasn't anything bad about that. It just like is what it is. And then I think, you know, as I got older and then there became platforms like Instagram and it just sort of, it was never like, okay, I'm going to do it now. It just was like, this is how I feel today. I'm just going to say it. And then I think over time, especially once the podcast started, um, the feedback I got about the sharing was so overwhelming. That was probably the point that I started to realize like, this is in many ways a gift. Like it is hard for lots of people, but just with any of our gifts, we don't realize that they are because you don't know any different really. So it's like, oh, wait. And then you find out like nobody else really wants to do this, you know? So I, I think then it, it just became very empowering. And I felt like, well, why, why wouldn't I? If something that's so easy for me seems to be helping people, how great is that? You know, I mean, I feel like that's a huge part of my purpose. So I, I, that's to me is the last piece of the pie. I think when you're connected to what it is that you're supposed to be doing, it's just easier across the board. Like it's just easier that, because that's the whole point. We're supposed to align with our purpose. And when you do that, you have less obstacles. Do you feel that as the founder of Bando, a successful company, people are so much happier to hear and relate to your story? It gives them a, a bigger sense of hope and saying, oh, look, Jen is funny. She's successful. She's ha She has a lot of hard days and she shares them all with us. And yeah. she shares her happy days and she shares her thought, I can make it. Totally. And if you, did, you didn't have that piece, do you think people would say, oh, she's just an ordinary woman that's suffering and they wouldn't have that element of hope of together is better? Well, certainly. I mean, had I not had a relatively major published accompl accomplishment there that that's very tangible. Certainly, I don't know whose radar I would be on anyways. You know, the, the creation of Bandeau and the growth and what the evolution of our brand really allowed me legitimacy in many ways. And then, you know, the things I was doing, you know, it all sort of complemented each other. But yes, the whole point is to show and the point of sharing and writing that book and having the podcast and being very explicit about what my... Uh, 
challenges are and seemingly negative traits and all that is to show that like uh, you don't have to be completely together and perfect in order to achieve things you want to achieve. You just go after them and with optimism. <laughs> and, and, and so I do, I feel like it's a lot of, well, if she can do it, I can do it. And I hear that a lot. And I think, I feel like that's really important because I don't think we're shown that picture enough. But yes, uh, without Bandeau, I think it would have been harder for me. I mean, I just get a lot of exposure through that. I feel like it's sort of like the symbiotic relationship where I help Bandeau, Bandeau helps me. And you pay it forward because yeah. every person that gets hope from you, and it doesn't have to be in creating a company, it could be in being uh, forgiving their parents for the way they were mistreated or, or yeah. if it could be just showing up better in the relationship. You talk about your relationship with your husband, your ex-husband so yeah. openly and it was such a raw part of the book, literally raw. Yeah. I found myself crying because I know what it feels like to have so much empathy. Part of what we are, we're super empathetic and everything yeah. is like 10 times worse than what yeah. we feel. Like everything is like uh, so, so heightened. much worse, yeah. heightened. Yeah. I totally felt like I felt your heart breaking sometimes. Like, can I just die that I don't have to feel all this anymore? Because it's just so much to carry. I'm carrying his pain, my pain, our pain, our dreams, my my hopes that I'll probably never have, or yeah. my future of saying goodbye to something yeah. that I had. How did you do that with going through, at the time you weren't on medication, which I think like, wow, I don't know how you did it without medication. Yeah. And like, how did you recover from holding that pain for him and saying, that's not me? Like disconnecting and say, I showed up as much as I can. I did the best I can. And loving someone, but still letting it go and yeah. understanding that it doesn't have to be together all the time. Yes. Well, I mean, while it was happening, I did not do a good job. It was very easy to articulate everything I was feeling once I had, you know, years in between the experience and me and a lot of growth in my self-awareness in, you know, I, I wasn't really aware. I I was aware that um, we were both unhappy for a long time, but I didn't really know the best way to solve that. But we did try everything. So I think, you know, the thing that you didn't mention that was a really important part of the marriage was Bando because it basically gave me this other outlet that was a passion and a love for me. And so what I was losing in my marriage, I was sort of gaining in some other strange way through my passion for Bando and like how reciprocal that relationship was and like everything I put in, I got back. And, you know, in the marriage, it wasn't exactly the same. It wasn't the same for either of us. It, it wasn't like, oh, I had a bad husband. I didn't have a bad husband at all. We just just, you know, our, our paths crossed and then they went in different directions while we were still married. Um, and that's hard, especially when I feel like we were both compromised emotionally and mentally. And I was busy enough with Van to like, I just didn't deal with it. So it wasn't even that I was like actively carrying that burden. I'm sure on, on some level I was, but I was numbing myself with food and socializing and working and drinking and having fun and sort of just come to terms with the fact that like, this will be the unhappy part of my life, but I'm not going to do anything about it. It wasn't until things like really, I mean, there were some just radical shifts from the universe that it was like, okay, actually, we probably should just move on. But at that point, it, the heartbreak had come so many years earlier that it was sad. But I think we both knew it was the right thing to do. And because there, we love each other and there wasn't this animosity and there wasn't like a breach in trust and like... And there weren't, our lives weren't intertwined. We didn't have children. Like it just set us up for the ability to do it in a way that's less emphatically negative than most. So, but I think if we had decided to get divorced in the thick of it, it probably wouldn't have been as great. You know, it was almost like we were just petered out. Yeah, right. <laughs> so. But in the book, you write about if you did, you were separated, you got back together, and then yeah. one of his parents were sick, he moved back to Australia. And yeah. then when he, left, you had this void. Oh my God, it's really happening. Like the divorce is a real thing. Like, 
Yeah. That's it. But then yeah. there was the freedom. So there was the yes. morning of the dream, but the freedom of the future. Yes. And it really a huge weight lifted off of me because like what you mentioned, you know, whether it was asked of me or not, I was carrying all of the burden of his unhappiness, our collective unhappiness, my personal unhappiness, and trying to problem solve all of that in my very busy mind. When the when that sort of lifted after maybe like six Six months, there was a lot of room for other stuff. So I felt like a weight lifted off. I felt clarity, but then I also got clarity on how awful I was doing. Really not necessarily because of the, the divorce, but just because of all the things that were hidden under the marriage. And that was incredibly confronting. I mean, it's just a really challenging time in my life. That felt very hard, but you know, I was very determined to get through to the other side. Um, and so that's what I did. And I had the freedom to do that because I'm just a single person. I don't really have, you know, there's very little things that I absolutely have to do or places that I absolutely have to be. And I took advantage of that. Do you think at the time you would be able to be married to anyone? Is there anyone that you could say, not a specific person, but like a description of a human that would say, this would fit a profile, somebody that I could have been married at the time and still create my passion was just Bandeau and love Bandeau and pour all my heart and soul into my other passion, but still have a lover. Oh, totally. We just weren't equipped as a couple to communicate and to understand, to deal with that. And then, like I said, on top of everything else, like our paths in life were sort of going in different directions. And, and I also think, and I talk about this in the book too, you know, like I think it's hard, you know, traditionally, even though we, as as women want equality, there's a long history of the man being the breadwinner and um, the stronger partner in, in keeping things together, you know, in that way. And I think it was, that was flipped. And I feel like that was really hard for both of us, probably harder for him than for me. Had, had the person I was married to been feeling fulfilled because of their own things, that could have changed, radically changed the dynamic. That's just not what happened. Right. Yeah. So you're saying if he was um, supportive and excited for you and cheering for you, just like your father, and yeah. being okay with with whatever journey he's at at the time, that would be okay for you. Of course. I mean, it would be okay for him. Like to be able to cheer someone else on, you have to feel good about yourself. You can't get excited about someone else's success or happiness if you are feeling awful. Like it doesn't even mean that he would have to have his own success. But, you know, inevitably my success was like some form of a criticism against him, which I completely understand. Like he didn't do anything other than be a human being. Right. Human. <laughs> exactly. You know, like, I, I mean, I don't know that I would have done any better. There's just like particular dynamics like that. But yeah, I think, I, I don't think there's one if if he was just like this or if i if my partner was just like this i i think with many things like there's a lot that has to continually go right for a relationship like that to work and we just didn't have that luck and are you looking forward to getting remarried or you're enjoying where you are now yeah i like you know i i feel like i'm glad that i was married because the box has been checked so i don't feel this like low level anxiety of like i didn't have this rite of passage or something but i i am not a person i mean Certainly the pandemic has challenged this, but I'm not really a person that gets lonely. I'm quite content by myself. I'm open to that. I mean, at the moment, I feel more like I wouldn't really want the distraction of starting a new relationship because I feel like there's a lot that I want to do and I tend to get lost in relationships. But I would totally, I, I mean, it's sort of, I was talking to my friend about this the other day and I was like, I'd be happy either way. I don't, it's not something that I'm aspiring to have happen, but I would not stop it if I met someone. But also it's like, you don't have to get married. You can just be together. 
Uh, right. You, know. you get to a certain point in life that you realize that the relationship, you have to be in the now, in yeah. the now versus these big, big ideas of society. They tell, uh, like my mother always says that I say the they, she's like, who are the they that you talk about on their podcast? <laughs> I like society. I know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, the collective. Yes. And, and sometimes we have to check in with ourselves and say, okay, what is good for me? Like if I lived on the moon alone, what would I want? What would be okay yeah. with? me. And sometimes, yeah. and it's so, especially with mental illness, we really have to check in with ourselves and say, okay, maybe where I'm living, this is, this is okay. But with me, it's not okay. Not okay. Yeah. And that's when you, you, you talk about it so nicely in your book about boundaries and, and boundaries that must be implemented. Yeah. And when you realize, especially with mental illness, you, sometimes the people that you love the most are the most toxic Yeah, and the boundaries yeah. are your really like your survival kit. And if you won't have your boundaries, you can fall deep inside. So how do you implement boundaries with people that you really love? Well, um, I'm still learning a lot of that. You know, I think it, I think it really has to do with strengthening your connection to your own self-worth and liking yourself on a level that most of us don't. And I feel like when that happens, you just trust and protect yourself in a way that naturally you wouldn't, then the boundaries are easy because you're like, I need to self-advocate here. Like you can't cross that line with me. That's too painful. You know, it, it's, it's almost like in the areas of my life where I've been able to start doing that, it's like, cause I feel very comfortable there and I know what is bad and I've been burned enough times that it's like, well, I don't want to do that anymore, but it's hard. And I would say with most toxic relationships, unless you have to have that person around, the best thing you could do is not have a toxic relationship that the only way to make it work is to have boundaries. You know, I think healthy boundaries in healthy relationships are important, but those would be more natural. But again, like that's, that's a, we could spend hours just talking about that because it's, you know, it, it, it really, are, there, what I'm finding is there really are these fundamental things underneath all of it that make these other things that we're trying to like take care of float away. You know, it's like really getting to the root of things, which those are deeper and harder to get at. So we end up cleaning up the surface. What I have understood is like the deeper I can get with that sort of excavation, the easier some of those top level things get to do. It's like you just, you have the knowledge inside of you. Like we, we have all the knowledge inside of us. We're just not we're just not taught to access that. Not only that, we're taught to shut it down because yeah. who are you? Who are you? Yeah. Did you research yeah. this? Like, who are you to know this? You don't know. Yeah. Go to the yeah. experts, but we are the experts of us. We're 100% the experts. That's a weird, you know, that's a weird concept to get used to. I, I mean, I, it's something that I've understood for maybe three years now. So it feels like, duh, to me. <laughs> but I think right. most people is like, well, what, is, what do you mean? So right. Um, we're getting there, you know, yeah. we'll get there. I, I love that part. And when I was going through my journey, Brene Brown was a big part of, of my learn everything she says, I study a thousand times. And she just had a podcast with um, Harriet Lerner on, on um, um, apologies. Yeah. I listened to it three times because one of the things that I struggle with is accepting apologies and forgiveness. And what does it mean? And how did you say it? And what did it, it, is it for you or is it for me? And is it for us? Is it for the future? Was it the past? And, <laughs> and, and it was so, so good for me. But when she spoke about boundaries and she said, look around you and the people that you respect the most, you're going to see, they have the strongest boundaries. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh my God, you mean if I say no to someone that means that I'm not that I'm okay. Like I'm not, I'm not mean. I'm not valued by my yeses. Yeah. I'm actually valued yeah. by what I need for myself. Yeah. And that was like such a big moment of my, oh yeah. my God. And the second I started saying no to people that were toxic for me, I literally was able to breathe with more oxygen. Yeah. We don't realize how toxic literally they are for our mind, for our bodies, for, for our thoughts. Sometimes it's so hard to say no to somebody we love, yeah. but if we don't love ourselves first, 
we can't love others. Yeah. Like you said with your husband, ex-husband, that like you really have to be okay with yourself in order to give. Totally. I, I love that part in your book that you you talk about boundaries and, and being kind to yourself and knowing. And the best part, I know we have to go, but I, I love and I laughed so hard and I made my kids listen to it. The part that you describe your then partner in Bando with the apple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was definitely a low for me. That, no, but it was exact. I I laughed so hard because my kids know they're they're not allowed to chew chips near me when I'm yeah. irritated. Usually they're not allowed to. Don't chew chip. Don't chew gum near me, and don't bite into a hard apple near yeah, mommy. Don't do that, especially <laughs> when I'm irritated. They yeah, just don't. very triggering. So I laughed so like a hard. Assault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you speak about the. Um, the way you parted ways. And it was in such a beautiful way that like you valued what she brought to the table, but you just knew for the next chapter in life, you just had to sell Bando and move on. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. courage. Yeah. I mean, listen, I think in many ways we were forced into that decision and it similarly to the marriage, it, some of it had run its course. You know, I think there was no clarity of what was ahead. It was more an identifying of like, okay, well this chapter is ending, you know, it's clear she was moving and, it, it just, again, I think sometimes we, you know, the best thing we can do is like sort of pay attention when the universe is intervening and like course correcting our paths. Or um, I think putting me on that path and putting her on her own path was probably the right thing for both of us. I, again, I don't think we're trained to look at situations like that before, you know, oh, partner split, bad uh, business. It's like, no, it just created uh, different opportunities for for each of us, and um, and yes, with that, like there wasn't high levels of anger. Like certainly, there was low lying stuff because it's hard to be in any close relationship with anyone, you know. And having a business together and trying to figure it out while you're having financial issues and personal stuff uh, does not. I mean, I was not the best version of myself <laughs> for a lot of that. I was an okay version, but... Um, you were a growing version. Yeah, but I think like in, in the end, I'm always trying to not be a jerk. Sometimes it just gets the better of you. Less so now because I have a better understanding of my feelings, but, um, but yeah... Think- I think you're really understanding and you know how to reflect back and make it right, which most people don't have the tools to do it. And they're like, just either holding the shame and the regret or they're blaming the other ones, but they can't just say, you know what, we messed up. How, like, let's figure it out. And, and I, I, have many friends that are divorced since, since I'm young. I don't know why my mother always says you're attracted to divorce. And I, and I don't know why, maybe because I'm very empathetic and I just, yeah. I don't, I don't take sides. I never take sides because I don't think there you could, you're not allowed to. Yeah. And one of the things I always say, I hope the world is going to come to this. The two people can be in love, get married, get married, have dreams. And when you grow out of each other, do it with sensitivity and kindness and compassion yeah. to the other ones. And it's not you sometimes they if there's abuse of course i understand but if they're just two people that went separate paths it doesn't have to be hate it doesn't have to be with like such pain that goes forward with you like yeah. just do it amicably like you did with your partner in bando i think timing is a huge part of that i think if we all severed ties and relationships the moment they really t- stopped working th- that what you just described is more feasible i think the fact that most of us just like fester in our unhappiness in relationships because it just be more of a disruption than anything else it just gets degraded over time and whether and that's when people do regrettable things and you know, fortunately, Andrew and I just was not in our who we were as people to do regrettable things. But we certainly were in that point where we could have and I think like that's what happens in a lot of those relationships is like, you're mad, you feel trapped. So you act out. Um, And then that causes friction. And then it's really harder to be like, I'm going to take this difficult thing and make it pleasant. Um, So I think it's more about how we manage relationships when we're in them, then the ending part is just easier. And I hope with mental health awareness that people are going to discuss feelings more and discuss disappointments and discuss weaknesses and be okay with it and not say, I'm a loser. This is where I'm showing up. And and how can we do this better or not? 
and yeah, it's okay. It is okay. <laughs> <laughs> How did you, what was your relationship with Bring Change to Mind? We, we, our company gives them a lot of charity because I think I'm, Wow, by yeah. what they do. How did your relationship start with them? We, um, when I, when we decided to create the necklaces that once had anxiety, once had depression, we sort of expanded. They were basically necklaces that represented my mental health journey. Uh, we wanted to do it as a philanthropic effort. And so in the research of like what organizations are out there advocating for mental health awareness, you know, they came up a lot. And so, um, and they were down to partner with us on it. It's been great. It's been very personally fulfilling for me because our money specifically goes to their high school program, which I think is a really important time to be, I mean, it's going to be easier to affect children than it is to get, you know, people my age to change the way that they've lived in the society they've lived in. So they're a wonderful organization and um, really working to do, to destigmatize mental illness. So that's important. Are you involved in the curriculum a little bit, giving them insight what they should teach no, the children? I'm very peripherally involved. Like just b- the times that I've been able to really engage with their community have been through that channel. So I did a speaking thing for their like high school summit and we did like a Zoom call. I'm like barely involved. I think my involvement is mostly the financial donations that we've given to them um, and trying to raise awareness about them through having them named in that partnership. So that's that's special. Very, 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 very special because I think it, it starts with children. And yes. I'm, I have two more questions. Can I actually ask okay. you two more questions? Yeah. Okay. So talking about children, what is your vision? What do you think would be a legacy that you want to leave for the next generation uh, that you hope the world will evolve to be regarding mental health awareness or mental health in general? Yeah, I think actually, I think my focus is more on building self-awareness in individuals, because I think when that happens collectively, a lot of that other stuff just lifts off, you know, encouraging personal growth. So for me, I think like, ultimately, what I want to do is continue to dissect the things that I feel like have contributed in the most major ways to um, me being the person that I am now that has this level of understanding and can talk about and deal with my mental health issues and um, situational things and business and all of that and sort of educate people on that because I, I do think that gets more to the root of it. Like I think in doing that, then you talk about it because you feel a different way or, you know, like I think sort of like systematically trying to change the way that uh, society views mental health um, and mental illness is not really in my wheelhouse like that. I don't think in those terms. So that would be harder for me. I think it's like, I could do something that's more personal um, and would affect future generations, you know? So do you think that that in the next generation we're going to see that it's completely open people are sharing when they're very no, young? No, oh, you no. don't have so much hope for for mental health. I just think it's not it's not a lack of hope, it's just realistic optimism. Like things really? just take longer. We can't change, I mean you can't undo hundreds of years of things in, you know, a 20 year period. You just can't. I I think what we're going through now is certainly speeding things up, but I still think more time is going to pass. I don't think we're going to go backwards. I think we're going to continue to go forwards. And I think, you know, when I talk to kids that are 14, 15, 16, they're incredibly articulate and have a much deeper understanding, but they're still, they still have parents that don't want them to talk about it. So you need some of that energy has to be cleared in order to do that. You know, obviously I think hope is very important, but I, I like to like mitigate it with just taking my experience and understanding like how long things actually take. Uh, But I feel really good about the direction that the world is going in that regard. I think in the last 10 years, they did like what it would take maybe a generation to do Uh because it's just so... I'm hoping just like technology evolves fast, maybe this will also, maybe, maybe, maybe the ripple effect. My last question that I ask everyone is what does hope mean to you? And I know you wrote about it in the book, but Give it to my audience. You know, it's funny. I can't remember what I wrote about in the book because I I think about hope, but I think 
more about, it's more general optimism than hope. Because to me, sometimes hope is dependent on a specific outcome. Like, I hope that this happens. I think where I connect with hope and where it sort of overlaps with optimism is just a general feeling of positivity that like, um, I understand things will be bad. I understand that things will be good, but ultimately I feel like it's all for a greater good. And that in the end, things do work out the way that looks may not look like what you had hoped it would be. But if you're open to releasing that and seeing the good in any outcome, that is, to me, that is what keeps me going often is that I've sort of released the idea of anything specific. I mean, it doesn't mean I can have specific hopes, but I feel like it just opens up um, an opportunity for me to feel happier and satisfied more when I'm just like, you know, walk forward with a smile (laughs) and wide eyes and aware of what's going on. And when things are horrible, try not to get too lost in it. And I think that is something that that hope is very powerful for people because it can keep that little bright spot in even the darkest times. For to me, I sort of just couple that with with this optim- like sort of just like a grounded optimism about what that is. But yeah, so it's like not letting the light go out. Right. That I uh, I like saying that the sun always rises after darkness. Yes. Sometimes there are places in the world that the the, the dark could be six months. Yes. But the sun always comes up. It yes. always rises in the end. Yes. And in life also, even in the darkest moment, it comes yes. up again. So that's hope. Jim, thank you so, so much. This was that's such an, an honor. Maybe next time you're in Boca and I'm in Boca. I live in New York, really, but I'm here uh, for the pandemic. We have a oh, year. Sorry. So uh, talk, about, talk about hope. We bought this house when I was so depressed. And my husband said, you know, let's leave New York. Maybe you need sunshine. So we uprooted our kids, four kids. We moved to Boca, bought a house. It was so bad here. I had another yeah. whole medical scare uh, I had to go back to New York, uh, but we kept the house. So I always yeah. say like, God gave me this house sure. when I was depressed. So yeah. the future, I mean, totally, yeah. that's the yeah. way it is. You got to look back totally. to see where it is, where it takes you. So thank you for joining me. Grab her book, The Upside <laughs> of Being Down. I say buy the book and gift it to somebody and listen to it on the audio and then listen to it again and then listen to it again. <laughs> And take Thank notes you. and take notes. It's been such an honor and ple- pleasure, privilege. Thanks for being here. And <laughs> thank course. you, everyone, for joining us. Bye till next time. Thank you for joining us and taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Please hit the subscribe button so you can hear further episodes. If you are listening to us on iTunes, please leave feedback and ratings below. Let us know if there's any topic that you would like to hear from us in the future. Bye till next time.